you don't have to know exactly what to do on every phase of the journey. You have to allow the energy to do its work. You release attachments to people, places, and things by being one ready to by saying out of your mouth that you're ready to change you're ready for a new story you're done playing games you decide what it is that you want to create welcome back to a moment with zen I am Zen, and I'm so excited to have you all here with me in Conscious Communion once again. I'm a spiritual life coach, a healer, sound healer, trained hypnotist, and I specialize in helping people uproot childhood and intergenerational trauma so they can inherit a true legacy of mental, emotional, and psychological well-being. And so today, we're gonna discuss a couple of things, but we'll start off by talking about how to tap into your divine intuition. First, understand that everyone is intuitive. Some people say that their intuition doesn't work, but if you didn't have an intuition, you wouldn't be alive. There are a couple of different levels of intuition, but the way that you connect with your environment, the way that you sense what's going on, the way that you feel the vibes, feel the energy, that in itself is your intuition in action. If your intuition didn't work, you wouldn't be able to sense danger. You wouldn't have a sense of fight or flight. So at its base level, your intuition exists in order to protect you. You've got your normal five senses and your sixth sense is that sense that says, mm, something's not right. I'm picking up on an energy. I'm picking up on something around me that letting me know that I need to pay attention outside of my normal five senses. So there are three levels of intuition that we operate at. And in order for you to tap into your divine intuition, and that's that divine voice, you've got to first master the first two so that you can get to a point where things are no longer personal. Intuition that everyone has, we all have survival intuition. As I said, this is your sense of fight or flight. Once you evolve beyond survival intuition, you take it a step higher into personal intuition. This is your spirit guide, your higher self. This is that sense that tells you something inside of me is not right. This is how you hear yourself, but this is also how you connect to the people that are closest to you. At the second level of intuition, your higher self and your spirit, they're prioritizing your healing. Tapping into divine voice now, allowing yourself to ascend beyond the level of personal, this is where most people get stuck. Because when you're tapping into divine voice, when you're tapping into divine intuition, this is when you're starting to hear things that you don't want to hear. On that second level of intuition, your higher self and your guides be telling y'all stuff y'all don't want to hear anyway, you still don't be listening. <laughs> when you're trying to cultivate your intuitive gifts, what you're asking is to be able to live life from an energetic place. In order to ascend beyond the level where it's personal and to truly tap into that divine voice, because that divine voice is gonna lead you where you wanna go, but it requires you to fully surrender to the process, fully surrender to what you hear, and fully surrender to yourself. In order to do that, you have to start to allow things that you don't want to hear to come through. And you also have to start to disconnect from what the physical world looks like and disconnect from what your physical environment is telling you. Because now, as you're starting to operate more from a place of intuition, more from a place of pure connection, it's less about what you're seeing physically and it's more about what energetic hits am I picking up on? The cultivation of my intuition was a very interesting journey for me. When I was younger, in my college days, outside in the streets, there were plenty of things that I heard. And what was really interesting is at, at that point I didn't know it, but now that I look back on it, I can see how my guides, my ancestors, they really were walking with me because it, it always did feel like someone was with me talking to me. But I didn't want to listen to what they were telling me. There were so many circumstances where I knew, quote unquote, right from wrong for me. I knew things didn't feel right. 
I knew that whatever it was that I was about to do wasn't for me. And sometimes, sometimes I would listen. One time out of 10, I would listen, but I was a very uh, rebellious little girl who liked to play with myself and honestly, who liked to play with my life. My college friends and I always laugh and say, I don't even know how we're alive right now. And seriously, I don't know how we're alive right now, except just for the grace of God and the grace of the ancestors. There were so many times where I would hear and I did not want to hear what I was being told to do. And so when I think about the way that I looked at the world in that time, I was in such a dark place. There were so many different ways for me to look at that experience, right? But because of where I was, everything that I was perceiving and everything that I was receiving, it had this gray lens over it. It's the best way that I can explain what it felt like at that time. And so it was almost impossible for me to connect with my higher self and to truly connect with a higher guidance because I was living from such a physical place. I don't even think I wanted to live from a spiritual place or from an energetic place. Being outside was very, very fun. So it wasn't until I started to listen to the things that I didn't want to hear, until I started to break past the fear that would surface because I would hear what I needed to do, but there was always something that would rise up in me and say, well, how is this going to affect my physical reality? Every time I would hear, you actually need to do this. You need to say this. You need to express this. You need to admit this. And it wasn't until I started to allow whatever I was hearing, I had to release the fear around what would physically be affected. At the point where I started to release those fears, that's where I started to be able to pick up on so much more intuitively. That's where I started to hear more. I started to have prophetic dreams. I started to see more. And um, it was at that time that my gifts really started to shift. And I say at that time, but y'all, this is years later because it took me years to listen. It took me years <laughs> to listen. But as soon as I started to listen, even just a little bit, even just a little bit, I was given more. And so with me being given more, I was able then to attune more to what was happening inside of me. Because at the, at the stage in life where I was really just, we're going to call it a best life. Now this, this is my best life. I thought I was living my best life then. This is my best life. I was in such a space of lack of awareness of what was actually happening within me internally. I was so far removed from how I was actually feeling, how things were affecting me. All of the trauma, all the childhood things, and honestly, all of the traumatic situations then that I kept put, that I was still putting myself in. I wasn't feeling the full effect of them. And so it turned into a stuffing, 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 stuffing. Things just going lower and lower until it started to manifest this illness in my physical body. And it wasn't until I started to listen and started to live a more energetically led life that I was able then to naturally start to unpack the things that were happening within me. I was willing to hear more, so I was shown more, I was given more. It was at that point where I really was shown what my calling was. It wasn't until I was able to start to make things impersonal that I was shown, hey, this is what you're supposed to do. And then things opened up for me. So in answer to that question, how do you tap into your divine intuition? Recognize that you are naturally intuitive. They call them intuitive gifts, honestly, do I really think it's a gift? You're the gift. <laughs> you are the gift. Anybody can tap into intuition. Anybody can. It's a matter of how much are you willing to live your life energetically. But something to mention is that intuition operates from our right brain. Some people are more naturally left brain, which houses our logic and reason. Intuition goes totally against logic and reason. There is nothing logical or reasonable about the things that intuition will show you because it's operating off of energy. Our left brain is what we need in order to navigate our physical reality. But on the other hand, now you've got your right brain that shows you the unseen. It shows you the energetic. And some people's brains are a bit more wired to be more left brained, explore the possibility that you've got a voice in your left brain that's telling you that things aren't real and that it doesn't make sense. It's absolutely going to do that. Absolutely. We're wired to look at life in a left-brained way. Honestly, we're a left-brained society. So 
tapping into your divine intuition. One, understanding that the energy is there. Two, assessing whether you're someone that's more left brained or are you someone who's willing to um, explore the unseen? Are you imaginative? Is that something that happens naturally for you? Are you someone who's able to visualize with ease? That's also a great exercise in order to expand your intuitive capabilities. Start with visualization. And so then three, understanding that one of the reasons that your intuition might be blocked is because you actually don't want to see and you actually don't want to know. But it's first a matter of wanting to see and wanting to know things about yourself. So the more you're willing to be honest with yourself, the more you're willing to listen to that voice that's telling you these things about you, these things about your life, the trauma that might be coming up that you're continuing to suppress, the more you're willing to listen to these things and allow them to be without too much concern as to how they're gonna affect your physical reality because if it needs to be destroyed, if you need those tower moments, then the tower's gonna happen, let it fall. If it needs to fall, let it fall. After the tower comes the star, comes the light of hope. But self-assessing as to whether you even want to know. Have you created enough space for the things that you maybe don't want to hear to exist inside of your reality? And then four, the more impersonal you can make these things. Understandably, if it's about you, it's automatically personal, but it's about looking at your own life even from a place of non-bias. Do you have extreme judgments about the way that you want things to go? Do you have ideas about the way it needs to be? That right there will be one of the major blockers of your intuition. If there's something inside of you that says, I absolutely need it to be this way, it has to be this way. You're going to, <laughs> You're going to block out every piece of guidance that's trying to come in that's telling you, no, actually, I'm trying to tell you which way to go. I'm trying to light the path for you, but you're so dead set on it being a certain way. Start to allow the idea, the possibility that maybe the way that you think it was supposed to go is not the way. It's always a possibility, but perhaps there are better ways. Perhaps there are other ways in order to get you to where you want to go. When it no longer becomes personal, <laughs> when you're able to look at your own life from a space of, you know what, this is just what's happening. And I can look and say, this is what's happening. I'm going to allow what's unfolding to unfold. I'm going to listen, understanding that perhaps I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Perhaps I don't know how it's going to turn out but I can trust that there is a guidance that's leading me in the right way. I can trust that there is a force that's bigger than me that's going to guide me every single moment of every single day. And if I just listen and allow my resistance to take a back seat, allow my own desires to take a back seat, then this new energetic world of possibility opens up to me. And that is how you tap into your divine intuition. That segues us perfectly into how do you tell the difference between your voice and the voice of intuitive guidance? Because there are a lot of voices in there just saying things. There's a lot of stuff in your mind telling you left from right, up from down. And if you're anything like me at times, I feel like I'm being torn in two. I feel like there's one voice that's telling me to go left, one that's telling me to go right. And what I've had to do for myself is Whenever I'm hearing conflicting voices, one, I get still. A lot of y'all don't know how to get still, so first you need to learn how to be still. That means sit down and do nothing. <laughs> that means sit down, do nothing, breathe. Turn off the TV, turn off the music, all of the distractions. You need to sit still and breathe. <sighs> take a breath. So I take a moment to get still and I ask, Who's talking? <laughs> if you ask who's talking in stillness, I promise that you'll get an answer. Something to understand is that one, the many voices in your mind are coming from a couple of different places. There is your intuitive guidance in there. There is your ego voice in there, but there's also the voice of your fifth grade teacher that told you that you won much. There's a the voice of your mom that tells you you aren't doing things right. There are so many outside voices in there that are telling you different things. And this is why it's imperative to get still and ask who's talking. So now 
let's paint the picture that there are no other voices in your mind except for your ego and your intuition, which all of this is you. In order to start to tell the difference between those two voices, what you have the opportunity to do is to start to discern between your desires and your needs. Your ego voice is always going to speak to you in desire. It's always going to talk to you about what you want. Your intuition is never going to speak to you in want. It's going to speak to you in need. And so what are the differences between wants and needs? <laughs> a want is something that you can live without. A need is something that you absolutely cannot function without. Can you live without the couch, the bed, the specific type of food, the man, the woman, can you live without these things? You absolutely can. Do you want them really bad? I'm sure you do. What do you need now? What you need is to feel whole. What do you need in order to feel whole? This is a self-examining question. Look at all of these things inside of your experience that you're utilizing in order to try to fulfill yourself. That is what that ego voice is telling you in your mind. When you're feeling torn, listen to, is this ego voice speaking to me about something that needs to happen outside of me? Is it speaking to me in a language that says, I desire this or that, something outside of me in order to feel fulfilled? Because it's gonna say, I really want this person to listen to me. I really want my mom to X, Y, Z. I really wish this hadn't happened. I really wish things would have been different. That is the ego voice. And understandably, things happen, emotions come up, yes. But your intuitive guidance is not gonna to speak to you in this way. Your intuitive guidance is going to continue to speak to you in language that affirms your wholeness, in language that affirms the love of self. And it's going to guide you to do things that will always bring you back to yourself. That's how you tell the difference between the two. There's one voice that's gonna tell you to search outside of you. There's one voice that's going to always guide you directly back to self. So as you're starting to understand those voices, this perfectly segues us into how do we start to release attachments to people, places, things, scenarios, and really, how do you let yourself go? There are many ways to answer that question, but what feels most appropriate for the people who are watching today is that one of the reasons why you're so attached to people, places, and things is because you're attached to your pain. There's something about your attachments that reinforces your pain cycle. And there's something about this pain cycle that feels very comforting to you. And so if you were to let certain people go, if you were to let go of the idea of who your pain has molded you into, who you've become, if you were to release your personal story, you'd have no idea who you were because you think you need this story that you've molded. You think you need it. And so everything in your environment is reinforcing the idea that this is who I am. You are the architect of your experience. Whatever storyline you decide to entertain, that is how you're going to build your experience. Understand that if you're creating it, you can stop creating it. The moment that you decide that you no longer want to play this game, the moment that you decide that this isn't the story that you want to live anymore, it changes at the drop of a hat. It changes immediately. But the reason why things are not shifting for you is because you haven't decided that you don't want to play this game anymore. In the beginning, we need to protect ourselves. In the beginning, we need to cope. And so we create these patterns in order to help ourselves cope with what happened. But you're grown now. <laughs> you don't need those same coping mechanisms, but because you've built a life, you've built a character, you've built a persona off of your coping mechanisms, now you have all of these attachments that you formed in order to continue to reinforce that I need to continue to cope with this pain. How do you release the attachments? You decide that you're over it. You make the decision that I no longer have to hold on to that part of myself and I am taking off these pants. 
I'm taking off of these shoes. A good exercise to do is to physically act as if you are taking off a pair of pants or walking out of a pair of shoes. Shoes represent leaving one phase of life and stepping into a new one. So imagine yourself stepping out of those old shoes. You can even visualize those shoes being old and dusty, honey, because they are. <laughs> You've worn them. The soles are worn. They don't even have soles. Your bare feet, <laughs> your bare feet are touching the ground. Get as deep into this visualization as you can. Visualize your feet in old worn shoes. Now, see yourself stepping out of those shoes and you step into a brand spanking new pair of shoes. Those shoes look like the shoes of your dreams. They look like whatever you need those shoes to look like. And I'm seeing these shoes with wings on the back <laughs> because in these shoes, you're able to fly. You propel forward into newness. This is one of the ways that you can assist yourself with releasing the attachments, but understand that the moment you step into those new shoes, all of the old has to fall away. And this is where you let it fall away. You don't have to know exactly what to do on every phase of the journey. You have to allow the energy to do its work. You release attachments to people, places, and things by being one, ready to. By saying out of your mouth that you're ready to change, you're ready for a new story, you're done playing games, you're done playing out this simulation and you're ready for a new one. And then you decide what it is that you want to create. You decide that you're enough. And so everything that comes into your experience, every body, every place, every scenario that comes into your experience, you look at it from the lens of this is here for me to progress. This is here for my betterment. This is here for my good. And it's okay if it does not stay. Because at the time that I need to step into a new pair of shoes, I'm willing to allow everything that I have walked in in those old pair of shoes to fall away. That's how you release the attachments. And so just to bring our journey right back around in the releasing of your attachments, when you allow yourself to operate from a space of I am enoughness, when you allow yourself to understand that you don't need anything else, you don't need anything outside of you for validation. And this is taking it right back to those two voices that are in your mind. If there's nothing else outside, you've got that voice that speaks in the language of want, and you've got that voice that speaks in the language of this is what you need. When you start to release those attachments, you tap into that voice that says, this is what I need. Understanding now that everything that you want all of the desires will be fulfilled, but in a way that is now more in alignment with that divine voice. And now we're bringing it right back around to where we started with intuition. The more you allow yourself to start to disconnect with what you think you need and what you think you want, because that personal story has you looking behind. It's feeding into the past. There's nothing new about your personal story, it, it's already done. It already is. The more you release your personal story, the more easeful it is to start to release those attachments, the less you start to listen to that voice in your mind that says, I want, I want, I want, I want, I need, I need, I need. Understanding again, it's speaking in past tense. It's not speaking to you in terms of this is what we're going to create. This is where we're walking into. This is what's going to lead us to a space of wholeness the more you'll be able to hear that intuitive voice, connect with that intuitive guidance, and step fully into living your life from a more fulfilled, whole, and energetic place. Before we go, I'd like to read a few lines from one of my favorite books, Conversations with God. And if you haven't read it, highly recommend on your spiritual journey. So, this feels so preacher off I say, and the book says, <laughs> we're, we're, we're not gonna do that. We're just gonna, we're just gonna read. So, <laughs> you have this idea that God shows up in only one way in life. That's a very dangerous idea. If you don't see God in the profane and the profound, you're missing half the story. For God's plan for you is to create anything and everything 
or whatever you want. In such freedom lies the experience of God being God. And this is the experience for which God created for you. And this is life itself. I pray that every word that left my lips reached every single ear, every single soul, every single heart that it needed to reach. And I thank you so much for joining me today. And I'll see you next time. Amen. Ashe. Namaste.